Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And of course, I want to join the rest of the speakers in thanking and uh, congratulating Roland for making this uh, super nice symposium. I also want to congratulate whoever put this picture into the homepage because I thought it was a very uh, dynamic picture. And uh, it fits to my talk because this is about dynamics and I also had the luck to be after Sharon, so I had a very nice introduction about non -op uh, von Oppenheimer dynamics. And what I want to tell you today is a little bit of the efforts that we are trying to make in the group to push the time scales that you can uh, study dynamics. So when we think about the side state dynamics, I mean, one of the difficulties is that different from the electronic ground state, you can have many different pathways that the systems can go. So you are in the reactants, you inside the system, you arrive to some whatever uh, electronic is bright electronic is either state, and then you can have many different crossings, like conical intersections, single triple crossings, that allow you to have a lot of different pathways, a lot of different bifurcations, and at the end, very different quantum yields. And to follow these different pathways is something which is um, quite complex. So in a sense, you already heard that if you want to do dynamics, you need to master two different fields. So one is electronic structure. If you just solve the time-independent the time Schrodinger equation, you're going to have access to some different properties, like the energies and uh, the wave function. You're going to be, by yeah, optimizing different critical points, you're going to be able to have important uh, points of these potential energy surfaces, and you can even go a step farther and look into these crossing points and uh, the couplings. And then you're going to be able to imagine and postulate some pathways that the molecule can take. However, if you really want to see what is the system time evolution, you have to solve the time dependence running equation, which is here on the right. And this would uh, once you solve it, it's going to give you for free the time scales. It's going to tell you exactly which of these many different products you're going to be able to get and which are the branching ratios and the quantum yield. So you are going to get the movie of, of this. So in order to follow the system dynamics, one has a very long wish list of things that one is required. So, of course, you need to have quantum effects at some point, at least in the electronic side states, I mean, in the, in the, in the time-independent part, and uh, even more in the, in the nuclear part, like we have seen in the previous lecture. Uh, you also need to have a good method of electronic structure that is able to give you something which is cost-effective, but is still accurate, because you don't have to make one calculation. You have to make hundreds of thousands of those. So you cannot just say, I wait three months for a calculation, because you're going to have to repeat this, but you cannot make something very, very cheap, because then your data is not going to be reliable. Now, by definition, being non -open, von Oppenheimer, you're going to have many different electronic side states. You need some method which is accurate enough to describe the time evolution in these couple surfaces, and uh, typically the systems, they have more than one degree of freedom, so this is also going to put some, some limitations on, on, the, on the methods and the cost of your, of your calculations. And finally, chemistry, of course, in solution. So you also have to deal with how to put a suitable method for describing the environment that can be implicit or explicit. So on the quantum chemistry or in the electronic structure side, one can have many different um, methods and, and ways to do that. And I have, I think, this uh, very beautiful picture from, from this paper that show us that actually, I mean, you can just go from molecules to more complex systems, like pushing the system um, uh, method, um, like you have here the quantum chemistry method that gives you access to calculate um, few atoms, maybe tens of atoms, then you can go to some DFT methods and you can combine multi -scale with multi-scale methods, then you can push these scales uh, much farther. But many of these uh, strategies that you see here, they are hard to transfer to electronic side states. So actually, it's just this blob here and the DFT and the linear scale on DFT, which are methods that they can be used for electronic, electronic structure of the electronic side states that they are just uh, summarized here. And um, I invite you, if you don't know, to go to, to this book that uh, together with my host, we edited it um, uh, last year, where you have a lot of chapters about the many different methods from the quantum chemistry that you can use for describing electronic side states. Each of these methods comes with an accuracy, comes with a cost, so you always have to make a balanced choice 
of what you want. On the uh, nuclear uh, dynamics part, you also have a sort of, one could think, a Jacob's ladder on chemical dynamics. Again, I invite you to the second part of the book on dynamics for the side states. There you also have many chapters that explain you the different ways that, uh, or some of the different ways that they can be for solving the problem. So on the bottom line, you have classical molecular dynamics, which of course is not suitable for electronic excited states uh, in principle. And in the upper uh, place, you have the exact quantum dynamics. So this means, I mean, you really solve the time dependent on running equation, you have wave packets, and then, um, yeah, you, you, you go with that. And in the middle, there are like many different methods. And I'm going to be uh, focusing here in the trajectory surface hopping method and, um, and also for, for a moment for explanation on the quantum dynamics, uh, wave packet dynamics part. So if you want to solve really the exact uh, um, motion of a system, you have to solve this equation and then you have to think what do you have in the Hamiltonian. And this is just for a very simple case for a two-level system. So you have your kinetic energies and then here you have in the octagonal the kinetic couplings and non-adiabatic couplings that one needs to recover from the von Oppenheimer. Then you have the potential energies that would is what you um, yeah, normally would get with the electronic structure. But you also need the couplings here, spin of couplings, and maybe other couplings. And all this comes from the quantum chemistry. So you make your choice, and then you get these parameters. Once you have all these potentials and all these couplings, you can start propagating your wave functions. So this is just a cartoon that you see, OK? You just put your wave packet in the electronic excited state. You let it run. And then you arrive to a region where these two surfaces are closed. And then you have some non-diabatic coupling. This wave packet would just um, split. And then they will just, the two pieces, they will just continue propagating. And that's how you would do it, right? So this is very nice. And it has beauties, so it's exact, and it has all the quantum effects inside. But it has also some weakness or some ambiguities. And th this is that you need to have this three n minus six potential energy surface in advance before you propagate. So even if you don't know if you are going to need all the degrees of freedom, you need to have this full potential energy surface where you are going to propagate your wave packet. Now you can imagine this is a very strong bottleneck because molecules, they have many degrees of freedom, and 3, 8, minus 6, this is um, very large. There are, of course, clever way to do that. You can also go to some reduced dimensionality, or you can even think in making some model potentials, like harmonic type of potentials, or both, like reducing and making harmonic potentials. Uh, you can also go to um, yeah, clever, I mean, programs like MCDH, um, multi-configuration time dependent Hartree way of thinking in which you have a clever way to propagate the wave function and, and then it's not as, it's likely less expensive than doing just hardcore like grid-based methods um, uh, quantum dynamics but nevertheless the bottleneck is basically the same so at the at the end you have to make a choice of which are the coordinates that you are going to use and these sometimes cannot be uh, so easy or trivial a priori. So this is why there is another family of methods like surface hopping, trajectory surface hopping that have become very popular. And you see this is actually quite old, has been more than three decades already in place. And the idea here is that you just go away from the, from the dream of having this, this, this uh, uh, nuclear uh, um, a quantum nuclei, but you have classical nuclei that they're going to move in the, in the potential. So now the nuclei are just a ball and they're going to move. Now when this ball arrives to this region where the potentials are close to each other, cannot split like a wave packet. So you will have to decide whether it hops or it stays on the surface. And then if you, for example, decide that this is going to hop here at the place where you have this strong adiabatic coupling, then you just continue propagating in the, in the down surface. Now, the, um, the way to recover the wave packet is that you need to pay the price to have uh, a large, large ensemble of initial conditions. So you need to have many of these balls, a lot of these initial conditions. They're all going to run. Some will stay, some will hop, and then you continue propagation. And at the end, you have this swarm of trajectories that can recover the behavior of a wave packet. And then you have the statistics that are used to analyze. So instead of having just one propagation, you have many propagations. But this has some beauties. I mean, now you don't need to pre-calculate the potential energy surfaces. You can just calculate what you need on the fly, 
right? You are a position, then you calculate the energies and the gradients, you advance, and at this point you calculate the energies, the gradients, the couplings, and everything. So this gives on the fly of initial quantities. You're going to have many trajectories, but these are like independent trajectories in the simplest flavor of, of, the, uh, of this method. So this can be easily parallelized, but it's full dimensional. You don't need to make any compromise about which are the essential coordinates. Everything is inside. Of course, you also have a bad side, and this is that by definition, you are missing these nuclear quantum effects. So you have things like tunneling or interference nuclear co coherences. This is not included at this method. It's not good. So in the last uh, uh, decade, we started to use, we just swapped from quantum dynamics to surface hopping, and uh, we have a package which is called uh, SHARK, which uh, stands for surface hopping, including arbitrary couplings, and Sebastian Mai has, has done a lot of efforts just to make this, this package now transferable and usable for, for the community, so you can just download it, it's in, in, uh, in, in GitHub, and use it. And basically, this is surface hopping that, as the name says, includes any type of coupling. So in the, in the original version of surface hopping, you can only have non adiabatic couplings, so it means that you can only hop from and between surfaces of the same multiplicity, but often you would like to be a little bit more general, like for example, including spinovic couplings or dipole couplings, and then being able to swap between different um, um, uh, multiplicity surfaces. So by now we have a code that, uh, yeah, we are already in the second version, and hopefully uh, soon we have the third edition of this. We are, um, of course, able to describe ultra-fast inter-system crossing. Now we have many different uh, satellites in, into this that you can get time-dependent spectra, you can get also split solvation, implicit solvation, chart transfer analysis on the fly, and as I will show you later, also some uh, extensions to neural networks, to machine learning, and to some parameterized potentials. Now, if you think how expensive this is or how far you can go with this, I mean, you have to think chemical reactions, okay? I mean, you can visually see chemical reactions. I mean, this is not a side of states, but you can look at chemical reactions and they take macroscopically in the lab, they, they might take even seconds, okay? So now you think that one second is 10 to the 15 uh, femtoseconds, and we are going to be always passing through quantum chemistry, so very often a quantum chemistry calculation can take an hour or more. So if every time step in this sort of process we are propagating per time step, so if one would have a time step of one second, and if I want to propagate a second, I would need 10 to the 15 CP2 hours, and this is 10 to 11 CP2 years. And these numbers are so big that probably you have no feeling what it is, but the age of the universe is 14 billion years, which is 10 to the 9. So this tells you this is hopeless. It's not about getting so much computer time. Maybe you can access at some point such amount of computer time with brutal parallelization. But in dynamics, you are sequential. You need this computer time sequentially. So it's basically is, is hopeless. And this is why the simulations of side state dynamics Basically, they are restricted to some femtosecond or sub-picosecond, or in the best case, few picosecond time scales. That's the state of the art, okay? So I want to show you one example of, of the dynamics that one can nowadays day. I think this is an example that I like quite a lot because it summarizes a lot of uh, different type of complexities. So you have a transition metal uh, system, transition metals, they are for theoreticians, not uh, very pleasant. They have these metals that they, 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 they make you to have many different electronic excited states. We have the system in water, so we have to get um, to some multi-scale methods, so we can always partition. The QM part is just the chromophore, and then the solvent is going to be the MM part. And in principle, you can just plug everything into a method like Shark. So in this case, uh, um, here we have like six, uh, seven uh, singlets and eight triplets, so this means, remember, triplets are triplets, you have three uh, components, so this means 31 states, so this is quite a very demanding propagation, right? You have 177 degrees of freedom, and you have, yeah, the molecule and, and all the atoms, and you plug it into shark, you are patient enough, and then you get a picture like that. 
Okay. So here in this in this representation, you have all the singlets in in uh, in bluish colors and the triplets into the um, uh, reddish or brownish colors, and you don't see much, but you see that I mean you start in the singlets as you would expect, and then you have some very uh, fast decay of the singlets by internal conversion, and you have a suspecting front uh, metal complex. Uh, you have a very fast uh, population of the triplets. Maybe it's easier to see it in this way. You just can collect all the singlets and not the triplets in one line, and then one can fit this, these lines and get some uh, time constants. And actually, here you have a sort of like B exponential mechanism that is something that we call electronic driven intersystem crossing and something that is really driven by the nuclear motion, which is about 400. Um, uh, femtoseconds for the intersystem crossing. Now, for you to see like how you can even push these things to be comparable with the experiment for this molecule, there is also uh, experimental um, uh, time resolved fluorescent up conversion spectra just obtained from this reference, and the time scale that is just fitted from here is 144 femtoseconds, which is what, in principle, you would say you have to compare with these 400 femtoseconds. Now. The point, one of the points I want to make is that one cannot compare these things so easily because this comes from, from a spectrum, so you have a sort of like a pump and you have a probe. In the experiment, you always have a probe. In the theory, you don't have a probe. You just decide the system, you see dynamics, and we are happy with it, right? But if you want to compare these two things, one also should include this probe, so one should also uh, simulate the emission spectrum, and that's what you have here, and then you can just uh, deconvolute this thing, and then when you fit here the time constants, indeed, we find something which is 150 femtoseconds that beautifully um, agrees with the time scale of 144. So with this example, you, you, you see how far, how predictive can really these type of simulations go. You, you are able to get numbers that they really nicely agree with the experiment, and then you can interpret with experimental EC, because actually, as a matter of fact, I mean, this time constant was just attributed to intersystem time, uh, to um, in intersystem crossing. But obviously, this is not only intersystem crossing. Intersystem crossing had a time constant of 400 uh, femtoseconds. So this is a mixture of everything what happens once you probe. Right? This is basically, the, 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 it tells you how the, the dipole moment in the side states are, are changing. So it's a mixture, it's a convolution of many different processes. So one can do it, but just for your information, I mean, this sort of simulation took almost a million co hours, and it's very demanding. Another question is, yeah, we can do these things. You also see we have invested these million co hours, and this is only 250 femtoseconds. The siding part was, was very short, so that was okay. The question is whether one cannot push the system, the methods, the algorithms, the ideas a little bit farther to get beyond this, uh, this time scale. And then, um, okay, if, if now I recap, I, I was explaining to you, I mean, we have quantum dynamics, and it's nice because it has the quantum effects, but in most of the cases, in practical cases, you need to reduce the dimensionality and even use some, some, some model potentials like harmonic oscillators. So these are sort of disadvantages, but the community has been able to progress a lot with, with, with these things. And in surface hopping, you have just the opposite, right? You have these classical nuclei, which are not nice, but it's still somehow is, is working nicely. You have these ammunition potentials, and you have the full dimensionality. And then um, it was uh, Felix Plaza, which um, had a very nice idea. Why don't we combine, in a sense, both of the negative parts of the two methods, but the parts that they give you really the, 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 the speed up? So we can also use these classical nuclear model potentials but we're going to propagate with them on the fly. So we can just surface hop in, and we are going to propagate on pre-parameterized potentials like people in the MTD, MTDH community would do. And this, as I will show you, allows you to speed up by orders of magnitude. I mean, actually so much that it forces us to rethink, re the full shark code because it was based on, 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 on input and outputs and you have to wait for hours until your quantum chemistry calculation is done, but now suddenly you wait for seconds and the time in reading 
input and output is longer than the time that you do in the calculation. So one has to uh, actually redo everything on memory, and it's, a, it's in Python, so that's where the Python is, um, is there. So what is the idea of this linear vibronic coupling uh, model? This is uh, something which is um, quite old, that comes from the times of Koppel. I see I forgot the reference there, I apologize to them. But uh, basically this is a shifted harmonic oscillator approach. Okay, where all the harmonic oscillators in the simplest form, they're identical. So it's very simple. I mean, you require the normal modes, uh, you require the, of course, the frequencies, the excitation energies, and then there is something called uh, intra and interstate vibronic couplings. And this allows you to shift vertically and horizontally these harmonic oscillators, okay? So these are harmonic oscillators, so one needs to be aware of the fact that you have no anharmonicities, so they are only good for the reference geometry, so you cannot describe things like dissociation. Or if you have very strong torsions, and these are important, you cannot use them. But if you have rigid structures, like for example transition metal complexes, this is going to be, or this is something expected to be um, quite nice. The beauty is that you have all the degrees of freedom. You don't need to make any bias, any choice of coordinates. You can have all the degrees of freedom. And now, because we save a lot of time, you can reinvest all these winnings in, ha in having higher level of theory that you would do it on the fly to have a larger amount of states, to have more trajectories, or to have longer propagating time scales, right? So how good is really that? So I'm going to show you this, this, uh, this example. I mean, this is a three, um, a three atom molecule, so not, not in the spirit of the LVC, but just for you to see, I mean, how good is really uh, something like LVC. So upstairs here you have Sharkton uh, ab initio with a very good level of theory, with reference CI singles, and here you have the Shark LVC. And uh, what you see is something which is qualitatively not bad, right? I mean, you have here the singlets, and they have a very strong uh, exchange of population between them. Somehow in the, in the vibronic uh, coupling model, this, this, uh, this, this, this beating is uh, stronger, and you have a, uh, uh, um, um, a population uh, change to the triplet, to this 3v2 potential, the correct triplet that is happening in both systems. So quantitatively it's not the same, but I would say it's quite reasonable, especially taking into account that the uh, graph upstairs, it took, it's like about 100 trajectories and it takes you like 15,000 hours, and downstairs you can go almost to 2,000 trajectories and it takes three hours. Of course, you also have to pay for the parameterization, but that's, in comparison, nothing. Now you can wonder, I mean, how good is this at all, right? And this system is so small that there is also exact calculations for this. So this is MCTDH done in ab initio potentials, MRCI single doubles, and uh, you also see the right triplet going up. You also have the exchange, the internal conversion between these two singlets, and you also have this beating that somehow here, despite the difference between this and this, is uh, um, like yeah, from the ab initio. I mean, the, the potential energy surface description. Uh, so here this beating is, uh, is more accentuated, but funnily enough, if you also take this template and you plug it into MCTDH, then you see that you have the correct picture, but that this beating is also overestimated. And I say this because, I mean, if you would be able, and we have also, um, we use this as an argument now, the difference between this and this would be only the quantum effects, right? So if you would compare these two things, you would say, well, this should be better. Yeah, but um, in a sense that is, I mean, it's not, it's not fair to call it like that, but there is a sort of a compensation, compensation of, of, of errors. I mean, here you improve dynamic description, here you improve the potential energy description, but um, yeah, I mean, this, after all, is a very reasonable description of the reality, right? So now you can go into the unknown systems for which you cannot do exact quantum dynamics, like for example these body pies that you can substitute here with heavy atoms, expecting that they can have intersystem crossing, but now this uh, spin of a coupling is very small, it's just very few wave numbers, and then if you would just propagate one picosecond, you basically would see exactly nothing, but if you are able now to propagate something like 50 picoseconds, then you really see that the, the triplets start populating and you can get the time constant in the order of these 100 picoseconds. So this simulation is 150 trajectories, it costed nothing, and basically you are simulating up to seven 
uh, nanoseconds. One can go to more complex systems. So this is an example of, um, uh, again, a, a metal complex that is uh, interesting for some experimentally. So this is a cooperation with uh, Katia Heinz in Mines. And uh, this complex poses a further challenge because it has vanadium-3, and vanadium-3 has a D2 configuration. So it means that you have a triply degenerated uh, triplet uh, state. And uh, the ground state is a triplet, so you need to go from triplet to singlet. And then if you want to describe the mission, is from the uh, singlet to the triplet, so just the opposite that what we have. And you cannot do these things with the tight dependent DFT, which is the method of choice for these large transition metal complexes. You definitely need to have multi-configurational methods. So here we choose the CAS CF uh, 10, uh, 13. One is something like 54 states. And just for you to give you a flavor, if one would like to do this on the fly shark um, dynamics, let's say you want to propagate for one picosecond and do 100 trajectories, this would cost you like 50,000 uh, million hours, which maybe you can get it, but it's, it's, it's quite a lot. Now you do the parameterization, this, this takes you nothing, and then to run 10, uh, 100 trajectories um, is uh, for one picosecond is, is, is really uh, nothing, so you can reinvest this, this, this big winning and running 2,000 trajectories for a much longer time. And this is a system that really pays off to be able to push dynamics along. So here I show you a picture of uh, the propagation within just one picosecond, and it's not maybe not so easy to see. So we start in this, in this triplet, and uh, this has a decay, and it goes into other triplets. But here in pink, you have some almost like 10%, 11% of population going to the singlet, from the triplet to the singlet. So in the first place, we were sort of happy because this was happening. We were seeing this process, but experimentally, it was like only 1%. And we were surprised at 11%. And what happens is that actually, if you are only if you are able to push this into 10 picoseconds, you see here in the in the blob, you at the beginning you have this rise of the a lot of singlets, but then afterwards just decays again, and then you drop into really this 2%, which is in the order of of the experiment. And this is because you have many processes happen here. So you have uh, like uh, um, yeah going to all the triplets. Here, so you have you have this this uh, triplet singlet intersystem crossing, which is almost the 11 percent. But then you have reverse intersystem crossing again from the singlet to another triplet that is 9 percent, and that's why the the netto is only 10 percent. But the majority is going to the other uh, to the other um, um, uh, singlets. So you see, I mean, sometimes you need a lot of states to be able to describe the system, and you need to push the propagation long, otherwise you would just miss that, in this case, for example, reverse intersystem crossing was, um, was happening. So um, I think I don't have much time, but um, and I want to arrive to, to the end of my talk here, which is a, a graph to illustrate you. I mean, we just decided to collect the time scales of all the propagation that we have done at the, at, at the past, and then depending how expensive are the methods, I mean, you can just treat more systems if you go to ADC2 or time dependent DFT, but you always have a cost of thousands of uh, CPU hours per picosecond, and now we are starting to push this LVC dynamics very much, and uh, we can just really get to very large uh, systems that they have uh, hundreds of degrees of freedom, and you are in the order of one, picos one uh, CPU per picosecond. Now, in a sense, the bottleneck is always the quantum chemistry, right? So, I mean, you will have a molecule, and then the quantum chemistry is the one that uh, pushes you to have, uh, I mean, that you have to, to, to push to have potential energy surfaces that you're going to uh, fit into the shark. And uh, what the Philip Marketan in my group has been pushing now very much in the last years is to replace this very expensive step by machine learning, right? So you can just achieve, you can use uh, machine learning to get this, 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 uh, these expensive potentials, and then you can do the things much faster. So I'm going to show you here one example of uh, Julia Westermeyer, which is now a professor in Leipzig, that uh, was uh, one of the things that she did in, in, in her PhD. This is this. Uh, this, this small molecule here, you can do some normal uh, shark MRCI trajectories. You can just uh, do this for 100 femtoseconds. Well, this is something affordable. It's no problem. You can do that. 
but now you can just do neural networks and you see the behavior of these uh, potentials. This is quite nice. Like, this is uh, everything quite nice. I mean, you probably realize now, now this is a smooth app, so all these of these wiggles that we have here, because it was only 100 trajectories, if you do almost 4,000 trajectories, it disappears, right? So these are only artifacts of, of, the, of the crudity of the number of the statistics. And uh, 100 femtoseconds is fine, but now you can just push it a lot. So, I mean, we, we had like 200 trajectories pushed to uh, 10 picoseconds, and even two trajectories pushed to uh, nanoseconds. I mean, here for 10 uh, picoseconds, this was like almost, uh, would have cost like two months, but it took like 14 hours. But this took like two months, but it would have cost like 20 years, which is definitely not uh, feasible. So one using machine learning, definitely one is able to accelerate these and achieve these nanosecond time scales. Very good. Now, if you think about it, all these reactions that we are dealing in photochemistry, we and the field, they are all downhill, right? You have dissociations or you have photophysics where you just go to these crossings and you return to the, to the electronic ground state. It's full of ultra-fast processes, so it's fine to propagate for short, and then if you're lucky, you're going to see something. But there is another family of reactions that they are uphill. Right? And when you're up uphill and you have here a barrier, then this is going to be a slow. This is going to be on the order of microseconds, right? And still macroseconds is a million of nanoseconds. So before I was very proud to tell you in two months I can get nanoseconds, but if now I multiply by a million, it cannot be done brute force. Probably not even just with machine learning. You have to be more clever. Now, this sort of uh, reactions, they belong into the category of rare events, right? You are here, and even if you would be able to propagate, let's say, okay, let's do brute force, I'm going to propagate here for long, this is going to be very boring for a long time, and then only at some point, so you're waiting for a long time, and only at some point the action happens, yeah? that you just go upstairs. So this is not a slow process because something is happening slowly, it's a, it's a slow process because it's a rare event, it's like, you're waiting, I mean, nothing happens, and suddenly an earthquake comes, right? This is a rare event, and it's not that it's taking place all the time slowly, it's just it comes and disappears, right? So it doesn't really make sense to use brute force to push simulations for a very long time, right? The idea would be just to fast forward and go to the interesting part. Now, these rare events, of course, they, are, they have been dealt with in the electronic ground state. So there are methods like, for example, this forward flag sampling, that they are able to, uh, um, to, to deal with non-reversible dynamics in a stochastic non-equilibrium systems in the ground state. Okay? And the idea is the following. So basically, you define two regions of stable configurations, like A and B. And uh, um, then you start running, you start running uh, MD simulations here from, uh, from, from the A, like for example, this could be the reactants and that could be the product. So you start in the reactants, you run, you run MD, and uh, you can calculate some flux, I mean, which are the trajectories that get out of the certain boundary. And then you can define some interfaces. Okay? You define some interfaces. So then from the uh, from some of these points, right, like you can, you can, it's called like Monte Carlo shots, you can just run trajectories, and this can be anything. So some of these trajectories, they might come back, but some, they might arrive to the interface. So you collect the trajectories, the points that arrive to the first interface, and from here you send again trajectories, some might arrive to the next inter interface, others could return, and you're um, you're yeah, calculating the crossing probabilities and repeating these steps from interface to interface until you arrive into the uh, product region, okay? And then you could, uh, then you have what is called the transition paths, yeah? How you arrive from A to B through all these different interfaces, and you can just calculate finally a rate constant, which is just the product of this flux and the product of the all the different. Um, uh, crossing uh, probabilities. Now the question is, why not take this and extend it for the electronic side states? So that was exactly the idea that uh, we just teamed with Christophe de Lago, which is an expert in all these sampling methods for the electronic ground state. And it has taken us almost a year, but now we have an extended version of the open path sampling code that is dealing with all these sampling methods in, in which we also extended um, um, Shark. 
And now we have something that we call non-adiabatic forward flux sampling implementation, which is able to do forward flux sampling in the electronic side states. So when, when, when you do a side states, I mean, you, you start here, you're going to decide probably something is going to happen, you're going to whatever, and at some point you're going to be stuck. Okay, so first we're going to relax. We're going to actually, the equilibration step is just to arrive to this bottleneck place that you are not going to get out with, uh, with force. And there is where we start the nerves. So, so this uh, initial region now is extended such that it's not just one point in one electronic potential, but it can be anything in many different electronic, um, electronic side states and the rest in the final region. Um, so um, what I can show you is uh, two examples of model potentials where this is uh, already working. So one is an body crossing. So we have two uh, here diabatic potentials or adiabatic potentials, which are here coupled, and they have here a different, a particular um, gap. And uh, one can calculate the reaction uh, rate for like a, a particular uh, coupling strength and particular barrier, and is, it would be like this point. So we have design the system such that it's still there, that you can see something with, uh, with, uh, with normal um, uh, surface hopping. So the, this right here, if I would just put you the dot that you get with a, a standard shark, it will just be overlapping, so it's the same uh, reaction rate, which is, which is very nice. But now you can just uh, delow, uh, um, uh, press the temperature down, yeah? decrease the temperature, which basically means that effectively you are increasing the barrier and you're making this, this transition, this process harder. And uh, you see that we are getting this reaction constants. I mean, it, it's, it's getting hard, um, uh, harder to, to overcome this barrier in, in this uh, coupled system. But you can also see that if you make a fit with, uh, with the Arrhenius, it fits very nicely. So this is um, a good news. The second system is, is uh, uh, something which is uh, uh, a conical intersection. So now we have these, these potentials which are coupled in three dimensions. And you can repeat the same game. I mean, you can, you can uh, calculate the reaction rate. You can also increase uh, the inverse temperature, dec like decrease the temperature. And then this process is harder and harder for surface hopping, but it gets the same easy for for, for NAV. So you have here in this table, um, basically we have run like 5 million time steps, right? And this tells you per million, I mean, how many time steps uh, transition surface, I mean, tra trajectory surface hopping, like a standard shark needs for a particular barrier, like the standard barrier will be 3 kVT. Um, it, how, how many time steps it needs to make a transition, and this is how many steps is needed enough. And you see here it gets harder and harder, so you need many, 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 many more of these to, to get a hit in which um, you, you get a transition, but enough, this is almost constant. So for hard cases, basically you gain uh, like two orders of magnitude in, in, in efficiency. And then for the conical intersections, is sort of the same thing. So we are already, I cannot show you, but we are already running this in, in real examples and it's working. So it's, it's, it's very nice. And it looks like we can really get a speed up of two orders of magnitude, which is really something very welcome. So this brings me to, to the end. I believe that now dynamics could enter a new era. I mean, we're not going to be able to simulate seconds, so this is not uh, um, in question yet, or probably even microseconds, but definitely we can push it. And I'll show you a hierarchy of methods that we have in which we're trying to, to push this. I mean, we have Shark, which basically is able, depending how much money you want to spend on it, to describe femtosecond to picoseconds. If you use pre-parameterized potentials with the flavor of uh, linear vibronic couplings, you really can get more trajectories, better potentials, and times uh, push it to picoseconds. One has to be, of course, careful how long these harmonic oscillators survive, because they are not going to be good forever, right? It's not just push it to nanoseconds. It's like probably the harmonic approximation will not, will not uh, work, but you can also go to machine learning. I mean, once you are doing pre-parameterized potentials with something, you can also do it with machine learning. And now we are very excited that basically we should be able to climb up barriers and with this to describe rare events in the SID state. 
And uh, again, of course, I have not done the work myself. This was done by my group here. It was the after COVID, the first excursion that we could make with families and kids. So that's why it's a little bit crowded. But um, yeah, I'm very happy to show all the people I've been mentioning on, on the way and whoever gave us uh, the funding, the University of Vienna, of course, and all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very exciting, fascinating talk. Are there questions? Yes, you were first, at least. <laughs> I can, no, I, maybe I cannot. <laughs> ah, Hilran. Uh, Congratulations, this was very, very interesting. Um, when you do this uh, forward sampling, you said you first go down to a blocking point and then go back up with this forward sampling. Do you still keep in any way memory of where you come from, like inertia or anything like this, which could be, I don't know, important or? Or you just think at that point you have lost everything, you take too much time there, so it's... No, there is... So, so basically this is the general approach that we ca have conceived, right? Like that you would, in, a, in, a, in the, sy the model systems that I have, they are of course different because you don't need to equilibrate. You, you know where, where you start, right? But in reality, it might be thinkable that, yeah, first you just go through a conical intersection and at some point you are just trapped in a minimum and that's where you are not going get to at, at get up. So you would just run like a normal shark and there you will just switch on the NAVs, and that would be the, the re-initial conditions for the NAVs, and then there is no memory. But I cannot think why that would be important, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. For the sampling of rare events, um, I was wondering, and the fast-forward concept, how, how do you make sure you're not missing anything in between, or like, the, the analogy to an earthquake is you need to have some kind of detector that tells you it's coming soon. This is a very good question, and the honest answer is I don't know. We don't know. I mean, we have done this model potential, which, of course, we know everything. We are now doing uh, a real system, but we basically also know what is in between, and we know that you cannot do dynamics. You have to define your reaction coordinate, yeah, your collective um, coordinate. This is the, the price that you pay for, for, for these methods. And um, I also wonder that myself, right? I mean, very often, in theory, that's a problem. In the practice, I'm not sure if we will encounter this problem very soon, because as when, when we do dynamics, or the community that does dynamics, normally explores the potential energy surfaces with quantum chemistry. So you have an idea of the things that can happen to you. You don't know exactly where you're going to go. I mean, you might hypothesize or not, but you have some ideas. You also need to decide on your, on your level of theory, right? And for this, it's very important that you know the best that you can, what you have, which barriers, whatever you have, and to make sure that whenever you reduce maybe the level of theory because you cannot afford, then still you have the same qualitative picture. So I believe, or I, I'm hoping, that we always have an idea of how we should define these this collective variables. And then with this, we're on the right track, and we get something that is trustable, right? But I mean, depending on the complexity of the systems, this might not be true. And the hope is that we also arrive to discovery, yeah? I mean, sometimes you do all, we always do this, and I think the community does this to study the system a priori, but sometimes dynamics teach you different pathways, right? But still, you were in the right track, enough right track that you discover these pathways. So I'm also hoping that this gives you, but it's too early to say. I mean, this is now something is super new, and uh, we'll see. Yeah, I'm also interested in this fast, the forward um, method. So, I mean, in the 1990s, you know, John Tully and I did a reactive flux method for, for surface hopping, and one of the big issues, and I assume you run into it also, is, and I think it's related to the to the question about memory, is that in surface hopping you need a memory of your or of your of your coefficients, right? Because you're propagating them, you're maintaining uh, coherence as you go forward with the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So we came up with a reactive flux method where you start at the barrier or at any crossing point. It doesn't have to be the barrier, but you should choose a dividing surface and you propagate backward and forward in time. But you propagate with a with a non-adiabatic um, 
surface hopping algorithm that, where the non-abatic coupling does not depend on the coefficients and because, because we don't know what the coefficients are in the middle and you need that memory. And so then what we would do is we retraced the trajectory with true surface hopping, weighting it by the, by the ratio of the true surface hopping probability and the fake one that we used to get it uh, you know, forward. And then, you, and then you end up sort of, sort of like, almost like umbrella sampling where you undo it, statistically weighting your trajectory ac accordingly, and then you can get the correct, uh, you know, the correct dynamics from that. So it seems to me you're gonna have to do something along those lines in your method because how do you know what your coefficients are and you need to know them at the beginning if you're, if you're doing this kind of artificial uh, sampling? But, I mean, we try first with transition pulse sampling, right? And it didn't work because you need this reverse dynamics. Here we don't do any reverse dynamics. You don't need to have reverse dynamics. So you are advancing and you are advancing, right? You only discard these trajectories that don't, don't arrive to the interfaces and you keep the ones, but you are always forward. But so what are your coefficients doing as you go to these different pathways and explore them? Yeah, How you are you determining? You're just integrating the time-dependent Schrodinger equation and just letting them move? Sure, but I mean, that, that's part of the tricky aspect of defining these interfaces. I mean, how close are these interfaces so that you arrive to the interface and when you don't, I mean, these things are discarded. So you only continue forward with these trajectories that arrive to the next interface. And you have to play a bit with this to make sure that they are not very, very, very far because then you don't, you don't see anything, that they are not very close because then it takes you forever and, and these type of things. Okay, yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering how you know what the quantum probabilities are, though, when you get to this interface. I mean, you must have coefficients of your different adiabatic states, right, if you're gonna do surface hopping. Or do you just set them to one with your occupied state at that point? Yeah, we'll have to think about it. I mean, this is that we only have like two states, and, and okay. this was easy. And for the other case, we also have only like two states. I will have to think about how this really is done in our case, because yeah. we have, yeah. I think it's can, it can be done, it's just an interest, it's a challenge, I think, yeah. I'm sure it can be done, and I think the forward way will have the advantage that you don't have to go backwards, obviously. So, exactly, yeah. I mean, the price mm -hmm. is you need to put this collective variable, but right. at least you don't have to go back. Right, thank you. You see there is coffee time soon, so Leif, you will get a super short que question if you want. Try to be quick. I do my best, thank you. My understanding of this is limited, but, uh, so tell me if I'm completely out. But you, you were talk, basically uh, motivating with the high barrier reactions. And if you're looking at an ensemble measurements, you're going to have, even for a very slow reaction, you're going to have a, a certain probability that you react in a femtosecond and a picosecond, et cetera. And this gives us a typical exponential kinetics with a very long time constant. So what is the really the information you get out? I mean, okay, the, you see some trajectories that go there, but you have discarded all the ones that don't really reach all the way. So uh, to me, yeah, what, 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 what is the information you get from? from at the at moment, the I think that, I mean, what we get is the right, right constants. We know in which time scales these things are happening. But, but aren't you then just selectively taking the fast ones, the ones that, are, uh, that actually make it? I mean, I mean this is the idea with the sampling. I mean, mm -hmm. you, 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 it's like umbrella sampling, right? You are at sort of advancing yeah. and then you can redo everything, like undo everything mm -hmm. just, just to have, to have uh, th this time constants. So you have, if, the, if your ensemble is, is large enough, all these trajectories are going to be arriving, yeah, okay. arriving so there, it's a, it's and like you have these probabilities that you are going to, yeah. that you have in your, in okay. your. So, so at every interface, you're basically saying how many, how many, how many trajectories actually reach there, and how many did. Okay, okay. Yes, you can count this exactly. Okay, thank you for the questions. Thank exactly. you for the answers. Th thank, thank you for you. the talks.